Good morning and welcome to the Trusted CI webinar for August 27th, 2021. I'm your host, Jeanette Dopheide. Trusted CI is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about Trusted CI can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is NCSA experience with SOC 2 in the research computing space. Our presenter is Alex Withers. Alex is the Ass Assistant Director for Cybersecurity and the Chief um, Information Security Officer at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications, NCSA. Um, additionally, he is the Security Co-Manager for the Exceed Project and NCSA's HIPAA Security Liaison. He is also co-PI and PI and co-PI for a number of NSF-funded cybersecurity projects. Uh, before we begin, I have a few things to note. First, this presentation is being recorded. Second, participants are welcome to ask questions um, during the session um, using the chat box, but we are going to do things a little bit different, differently this time. We're going to actually um, read through the questions at the end. So if you have questions, go ahead and type them in, and then we'll get through them at the end of the presentation. And with that, I'll hand things off to Alex. Alex, welcome. Thank you. Um, so uh, I'm Alex Withers. Um, and as Jeanette mentioned, I'm the Assistant Director for Cybersecurity at NCSA. Um, and I wanted to write about our experiences with um, SOC 2. Um, and our experiences with SOC 2 cover you know, our, our research computing space, which is basically almost all of our computing. Um, and I'm not sure how prevalent um, SOC 2 is in the research and education sector. I honestly don't know. I suspect in healthcare or you know, medicine, um, you probably see it a lot more than you would in other areas. Um, but in any case, um, I, I figure we, we would go over our experiences. I think there is some interesting things that we've learned that apply to Regula regulatory um, regimes and compliance in general in research and education. And uh, possibly maybe there's some of you who are considering SOC 2 or are gonna be required to go through some type of SOC 2. And hopefully you can get something out of this presentation. Um, so the uh, division I work for at NCSA um, is the cybersecurity division. Um, our, our primary mission of course is to secure um, all of NCSA's computing resources. Um, in addition to that, we have a lot of research projects, uh, identity, access management, uh, transition to practice are some of the uh, big pillars. We also do a lot of work in securing um, projects, uh, NSF funded projects. Um, and recently we've been doing a lot of work in the healthcare computing space. Um, part of a uh, of our group, sort of a nascent part of our group is a compliance and policy group that's composed of myself, uh, Margaret Johnson, who's really our SOC 2 uh, expert, and uh, Jacob Gallion, um, who is a security uh, engineer. So um, the, uh, the environment that I'm going to really be focusing on is the environment that was in scope for our SOC 2 examination. Um, as I mentioned before, we are expanding um, our healthcare computing environment. Uh, what started out as in just a single HPC cluster has now expanded to an environment that houses multiple tenants. And the goal is that all EPHI storage and computing occurs here. EPHI is electronic protected health information. Um, so this is uh, a personal identifiable information uh, things like medical records, MRI images, anything like that, that would, uh, that's identifiable and protected by uh, the HIPAA law. Um, we are, uh, as I mentioned before, we had a research partner that uh, comprised the original HPC cluster. That HPC cluster is still there. We are expanding to a multi-user HPC cluster, primarily for researchers uh, that need a space um, to house EPHI and perform research on that kind of data. Um, this uh, environment is managed by three NCSA groups. We have a uh, healthcare innovation program, uh, which is led by Colleen Bushell. Um, the NCSA's uh, Integrated Cyber Infrastructure um, Directorate, uh, which is 
really the group that's responsible for managing all um, cyber infrastructure at NCSA, uh, sort of manages the cluster day to day. And then of course, um, the cybersecurity division, uh, uh, we both secure the environment and we ensure the environment is compliant um, with uh, required policies. So um, while I'm talking about SOC 2 um, in the, uh, our, our healthcare computing environment, um, SOC 2, even though it's scoped to this, it, it can really uh, encompass your entire organization. Um, and I'll get into that a little more later. So um, the first thing I wanna do, and I wanna be careful about this because it can get uh, to be a very long and big topic. And, and that is to introduce uh, or explain what SOC 2 is. And SOC 2 is an assessment of a service organization's system and controls. And they, uh, your, your controls, your policies, your processes, your technical controls are assessed. Um, and this, they're assessed according to uh, a number of categories. Um, these categories are called trust service criteria. They're very broad. Um, they're very, um, they're not meant as controls themselves. And the idea is that an auditor comes in and does an assessment of your controls against one of these categories, one or more, um, and determines whether or not you are operating these controls effectively. Um, but this also depends on the type of report you, you do. Uh, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about that later. The end result is that you have an attestation report. It's composed of four parts. The first part is the auditor's opinion, which is the critical part of the report. Uh, it, it tells you whether or not the organization, your, your organization is uh, operating effectively um, with these controls. Uh, the other parts of the report are uh, the management's assertion that yes, we this is our environment, we these are our controls, this is the, the, the description of our system. You have the actual system description, which explains in great detail how your system works. So for example, in our report, this would explain everything about the uh, ache environment we have, our healthcare computing environment. And then lastly, all of your controls, how they were mapped against the trust service criteria um, and how those controls were tested. So that is a very, very broad um, and, and, and not really in-depth uh, explanation of SOC 2. So let's get into it a little bit deeper. Um, as I mentioned before, there are five broad categories, uh, which uh, uh, AICPA, the organization that defines um, SOC, uh, the, these five categories are um, the, the trust service criteria. The first one, uh, is they call security. And that is composed of your typical information security principles, things like access, monitoring, data encryption, HR processes. Uh, this category also includes common criteria, which are kind of um, general uh, organizational governance sort of uh, criteria. And oftentimes this can, this would often sometimes be called the common criteria instead of security or security and common criteria, I, I find that terminology in the SOC 2 land is not always consistent. So in addition to security, um, you have four more. You have confidentiality, uh, how an organization will maintain and dispose of sensitive data. You have availability, which is infrastructure monitoring, capacity, backups, et cetera. Um, there's processing integrity. Um, and this really, I think, is more focused on organizations that do e-commerce or, or uh, do um, financial type of computing. And then lastly, you have privacy. And oftentimes uh, uh, people ask, what's the difference between confidentiality and privacy? Privacy is really focused on organizations that are dealing with PII. Um, and it's a huge category. Um, it is something though, I think has to be, when you are undergoing a SOC 2 examination, um, you should really very carefully consider whether or not you want to include privacy. You don't have to include privacy if you do have EPHI, if you and the partner 
have come to an agreement that confidentiality is adequate depending on the type of EPHI you have, I, I would definitely avoid privacy. It's a huge heavy lift and requires a tremendous amount of work on the organization's part to prepare for. Um, the first three, security, confidentiality, and availability, are what you often see um, in, in sort of uh, more typical environments. Um, confidentiality and availability are not very big um, categories. They don't have a lot of criteria um, in them, and they're pretty easy to tack on. Um, and, and I think probably gives you a, a better report. Um, so th that's a question that is, you know, the idea of whether or not to add privacy um, is a very difficult um, question, depending on your type of data. If you can avoid privacy, I would. Um, but again, that often boils down to the agreement you come under um, if, if you're being required to, to do SOC 2. So um, the next thing I want to talk about is you will often hear type one and type two. Um, they're very similar. And the primary difference between the two is the amount of time the examination uh, takes. So with the type one report, the auditors are looking at your environment at a single point in time. Um, and this shows the suitability of your controls and your environment. Um, it demonstrates system and control maturity. The type two report um, examines a period of time over six to 12 months. That's typical, uh, it can be shorter. I don't, I don't think I've ever heard or seen anything longer than 12 months. Um, and what it's doing is showing operational effectiveness and suitability uh, of your controls environment. And it's showing that your system, the maturity of your system is maintained over time. So with the type two, you say, here are my controls that I'm using to secure my data, secure my systems. A type one report would just look at those controls and say, we think those controls are suitable. They're acceptable. Type two would look at the controls over a period of time, gather evidence that those controls are working, um, and then make a determination as to whether or not those controls are suitable and are operating effectively. Um, I will talk a little bit more about this later, but the type two is often um, what you see as, as what people want to have if you have like a BAA or some kind of contractual agreement to do a SOC two. A type one is typically an intermediate step that you would do first if it's the first time you're going through um, a SOC two examination. Uh, just a quick note, you might have seen um, the term SOC three, um, that is just a SOC 2 report without the control testing. And it's usually because SOC 2 reports are um, confidential. A SOC 3 is a way to uh, present a SOC 2 report um, for public consumption if that's required. So um, I want to get back uh, to, to the, the definition of SOC 2. Um, and note that SOC 2 is not a compliance framework. It's a reporting framework. Um, SOC 2 does not tell NCSA what controls we have to have for the ache. Um, our ache environment, it processes and stores EPHI. HIPAA applies, of course. Our compliance framework for the ache is University of Illinois HIPAA Privacy and Security Directives. That's what dictates our controls in addition to uh, other controls that NCSA determines are appropriate, um, controls that might uh, be in a BAA or a data use agreement, that comprises our processes and controls. And in our environment, we have approximately 160 controls. Um, and, and those are all mapped to these um, trust service criteria I talked about earlier. Specifically, right now, we only do security and confidentiality. We define the controls um, and the, we do the mapping, um, and, and um, that is something sort of we own in addition to the system description. And I'll discuss how you go about doing that, um, but it's, it's, it's important to point out that sometimes people will use the term SOC 2 compliance. That's a misnomer. Um, there's, you, you, you're, you're being compliant with 
some required group of controls or regulatory regimes. SOC 2 has nothing to say about that. It is just examining your compliance and your controls and trying to make a determination based on this examination. You know, are you really doing, are you really implementing the controls? Are you implementing the processes? And are you doing it effectively in the way that you should? And then probably the best way to kind of illustrate that is to look at three um, example controls that I've checked. So on the left, I, 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 uh, uh, Margaret and I chose um, three controls um, that sort of illustrate the sort of the breadth of what uh, SOC 2 would look at. Um, so the first control, um, we have to conduct background checks on new employees. Um, and that's also, uh, that's a requirement by the University of Illinois and uh, there are other things that also drive that requirement as well. So it's a required control for our um, healthcare computing environment. Um, another kind of random technical control I picked, um, user passwords and count lockout settings conform to our identity and access management policy. Um, and then the last control is that we have to have a change control board that documents and approves changes to our healthcare computing environment. On the right are these broad um, principles. Um, these are from the security category. Um, and it, the arrows just show which principles the controls map to. And if you look at these principles, they're extremely broad and almost vague. Um, and this, this, this group of principles, um, uh, or, or sorry, trust service criteria um, are, are what the AICPA thinks should be in the security category. And you should have controls that map to these criteria. Um, and they use this mapping to test and examine your controls. Um, I would note that the mappings are not one-to-one. -one, so many of our controls uh, can and do map to a single trust uh, um, service criteria. So um, before um, I get into one of the particular control um, in depth, I want to point out that we're required to um, maintain these controls. And in order to properly do that, we have to have a mechanism at NCSA that tests these controls. Um, and there's several reasons for that. Um, one of the reasons is that if you're testing your controls, you are actually collecting evidence that you might need for the SOC 2 examination. Um, that doesn't always work. Um, because sometimes the auditors need to see you collect the evidence in real time. Um, sometimes that is adequate. Um, the second reason is that testing your controls um, is a way to sort of self-test the operational effectiveness of your control. So if you are anticipating a SOC 2 type 2 examination, if you're running through the tests yourself before an auditor is examining um, the effectiveness of your controls, you can catch problems, mistakes, or uh, issues with your controls before they do. Um, another reason we have test our controls is um, a SOC 2 examination can be a huge burden on the, the workforce. Um, and if you have a mechanism for testing controls and you have a sort of um, routine kind of playbook for each control that you could run through to provide evidence or show that it's working, um, you reduce the amount of time on staff because an auditor um, is going to ask, well, who is responsible for the system, you know, that this control is implemented on or, you know, what, what, or, you know, uh, what, or, what party organization is, is responsible for these HR or purchasing processes or whatever. Um, you, you know, if you're not prepared for that and you're not prepared to present the evidence, um, then you could be in a situation where, you know, you're taking hours and hours of staff time. So what we did is we developed um, a workflow to test our controls. This was developed by Margaret Johnson primarily. Um, and basically each, each control is um, sort of an, 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 uh, kind of a, an issue in JIRA. Um, and, and I'll talk about why we use JIRA 
And what we do is, depending on the control, we have you know specific cadences, um, and the control um, gets triggered to get tested. It goes under review. Um, whoever owns that control and whoever can um, collect the evidence or test the control, ideally it would be multiple people, not just one person. Um, they quickly demonstrate evidence of the control, uh, determine that, yep, um, this control is working well. I was able to gather evidence. It you know, does seem to be working. Uh, I'll mark that as satisfactory and I'll attach evidence of control to the issue or perhaps the control is not working. Perhaps there's an issue or they can't test it properly. Um, then it has to go into some kind of remediation. Um, you know, either, either the control itself is not right or the way you demonstrate the control is not working or perhaps there's some other issue and that has to go back under review. So it's a really simple workflow. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, we use JIRA to test our controls. Um, and the reason for that is because we just use JIRA for a lot of things at NCSA. Um, and it's very easy to implement this simple workflow I showed before in JIRA. Um, and so uh, this is one of the example controls um, I, I talked about before. Um, the uh, testing user password and account lockout settings. And so the JIRA issue um, uh, just implements uh, uh, that, that flow chart based on a JIRA workflow. Um, the test gets assigned to the appropriate staff member. Um, and then the question comes up, okay, I have this control, I have to test it, um, but how do, I, how do I conduct the test? Um, so in the bottom half of this JIRA issue, um, every control ideally has a playbook, which is a very detailed, simple step-by-step -step, uh, instructions for how to test the control and how to collect evidence that you have this control in place and that it's working. Um, and then uh, when, when you run through this playbook, uh, as we call it, you attach the evidence. And you'll see with this particular control, um, we had a previous test of this control run in November, 2020. Um, that probably means we have to rerun this test again. Um, with, the, with this particular control, there's nothing that dictates how often you have to test it. Um, by default, once a year is sort of the standard, but there are some controls where you may have to test it multiple times. Um, and that depends on how the control is written. It may also depend on the trust service criteria. So looking at um, this particular control, this is just a kind of a little snippet of uh, the document and Confluence, um, which is our documentation system. Uh, and it provides step-by-step uh, -step details on how to test this control. You can see that um, it, it, its first step is requiring someone to log into our KDC um, and start executing um, some commands. Uh, and, and the output of that will be either screenshots, ideally screenshots that are then attached to the sub issue that comes out of uh, that workflow. <clears throat> um, so I, I just wanna iterate that um, there's nothing magical about Jura or Confluence. Those are just the platforms we use. Um, this kind of workflow um, can be implemented in probably any sort of advanced project management tool. There are also actual commercial projects that help you manage um, these things. Uh, we really didn't evaluate those simply because we were trying to do this as cost effectively as possible. Um, so um, I've gone over uh, uh, SOC 2, what SOC 2 is, um, how we, you know, uh, the requirement that SOC 2, as you, you know, write or, or gather your own controls, um, how those get mapped potentially to trust service criteria and why and how you would test, you would want to test your own controls and the effectiveness of your controls. And I kind of want to step back uh, to, to sort of talking about SOC 2 in general. And the question comes up of why would you ever undergo a SOC 2 examination? I will be very honest. Um, I don't, I can't think of a reason why you would voluntarily want to do this. Um, it, is a, it is a very large undertaking um, and it does require a lot of uh, overhead on staff uh, and, and, and other uh, you know, processes that you would have to put in place, uh, et cetera. 
Um, I think that you can do the kind of examination, um, you know, without undergoing a suck two, if that was important. Um, but oftentimes, um, uh, you know, sometimes it's voluntary. You often see it, uh, you know, with commercial products so you might be buying, especially if they're cloud-based. Um, you will see them and they're, you know, you know like for, for example, NCSA uses Grammarly.com. Uh, you can click on their security uh, uh, section of their website. They claim they have done SOC 2 Type 2 every year and you could get a copy of the report. And it's just part of convincing you that your data is safe with Grammarly. Um, oftentimes you see SOC 2 Type 2 required if you have a startup and you're selling it and it's part of due diligence. But I think within the research computing sector, um, you, you really only see it as something that's required either by a contract like a DAA or some sort of a, a, a agreement or what have you between two partners. Um, I am seeing it. Uh, I have seen some universities that we have uh, partnered with have it as an optional requirement uh, in lieu of like, um, a third party risk assessment. Uh, but honestly, I think if you have the option of a third party risk assessment, that is going to be a lot easier than a SOC 2 type 2. Um, I have heard that it was required um, post incident um, uh, on data uh, uh, between a, a partnership between the university and another entity. But uh, by and large, I've never heard of anyone voluntarily undergoing um, a SOC 2 examination uh, in the research space. But then again, I, I really haven't been doing um, SOC 2 very long, and um, uh, it could just be that uh, I, I just don't have enough uh, anecdotal data. Um, so that being said, um, if you can avoid a SOC 2 examination, I would advise to do, um, um, if you can't and you're required to go through it, then uh, definitely going through the sort of testing uh, process and being very proactive and getting in front of it is going to be um, really the best thing you can do. And if you do find yourself in that situation, um, you are going to have to do uh, a lot of work. Now, there are ways to kind of uh, get out of doing this work with money. Um, recall that you or if you're going undergoing a SOC 2 examination, you have to provide the system description and controls. Um, that is something technically you have to write. And that is going to be the complexity of that is going to be proportional to the scope, uh, uh, proportional to the environment and scope. So if you have a teeny tiny environment of just a, you know, a handful of machines in AWS and maybe a GitHub repo and that's it, it's probably not going to be a very complicated system description or set of controls. But our healthcare environment, for example, which is not really that different than uh, sort of a uh, kind of, you know, a, a other sort of HPC system you might find uh, in the wild, uh, that's a fairly complex environment. Um, and the system description and the controls are pretty complex. Um, and you have to also uh, be aware that writing um, your controls and the mapping and writing the system description has to be in accordance with AICPA's description criteria. Now, it, all the documents on SOC 2 that are published by the AICPA are available online on their website. And um, these things are incredibly esoteric. Um, I find them very difficult to read through. Uh, there's a lot of jargon and terminology that um, it is, unless I guess you are trained in this or, or an accountant or an auditor, um, I find to be very inscrutable. So what people normally do if they find themselves in a situation is to undergo what's called a readiness assessment. Um, and you don't write uh, your system description and controls. You engage with an auditor uh, who will um, sort of sit with your organization uh, over the course of five days or so um, and learn all about your environment and write out uh, uh, your system description and collect your controls in one list and do the mapping for you. Oftentimes, this is the same auditor that would later then perform the SOC 2 examination. Um, this is a very quick way um, 
to get your system description written properly, uh, to get your controls properly mapped, to make sure you don't have any controls you don't need, um, to just make sure that it's um, going to be compliant with AICPA's um, criteria for uh, how the report is going to be structured and written. Also, one of the one of the critical parts of an assessment is that uh, the auditors might identify gaps that you have in your procedures or processes, um, and you know would advise you you need to have this. So if perhaps in the unlikely situation that your environment has firewalls, but you don't ever audit your firewall rules, they would tell you that is definitely a control you need to have because if you don't, you will have a particular trust service criteria on which no control maps. Um, and so that's that's a, a definite advantage of undergoing a readiness assessment. In terms of cost, um, I, I think uh, they're typically not, they're definitely not as much as a SOC 2 type 2 examination and they tend to be fairly reasonable because they're sort of, you know, the kind of uh, foot in the door for the auditor to then get your business to do a SOC 2 type 2. Um, I would mention, uh, as I mentioned before, um, some people advise you after readiness to do a SOC 2 type 1 as the next step. Um, we did not do that. Um, and the differences between a readiness assessment and SOC 2 type 1, in my opinion, are really not that much. Um, and I think you can probably save some cost by going right from a readiness to a SOC 2 type 2. Um, other people might advise differently. Um, but that, that's a question, um, you know, that's, that, you know, you would have to decide yourself. Um, <clears throat> okay, so um, I'm gonna go over some of the lessons we learned um, by, uh, from our SOC 2 examinations. I think that these are lessons learned pretty much in any kind of research computing environment where you are, um, you know, sort of stuck with some kind of compliance or regulatory regime. Um, and they apply to our SOC 2 examination, but really I think that they, they, they prove them to be um, good lessons learned just in general for our organization, uh, especially as more and more of our environments are um, undergoing or are, are, are being required to handle um, sensitive data. So, one of the things we learned very quickly is that we really want to minimize reliance on external data systems uh, when gathering evidence. Uh, we want to maximize availability of data. Um, and you, you don't want to be in a situation where data is being called for that you don't have on hand, the organization you, uh, uh, or the, 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 you the organization, uh, are being required to present data that you may not have. And you might have to go to like a parent organization or some other partner organization that might have that data. Um, that requires more staff time, um, more waiting, and uh, you know potentially um, it might be an exception if you can't get the data in time. Um, kind of a corollary to that is uh, collect evidence over time. Any processes you have um, that you have to perform, um, you want to collect the evidence as you're performing the processes. Uh, you want to automate that as much as possible. A uh, quick example of this, um, NCSA has a uh, purchasing system and the university itself has its own purchasing system. And yes, it is another layer of bureaucracy, but our purchasing system keeps track of who is purchasing what and all the approvals, including depending on what is being purchased an evaluation by the cybersecurity group over the uh, evaluation of the vendor. And so this workflow is automated and the evidence that we're doing this required evaluation of the vendor um, is self-documented. And so it makes it very easy for us to just pull that up when an auditor calls for it and, and present it to them. Um, you wanna make sure that your control language is, is up to date prior to the assessment. Um, if you have out-of-date control language or control language that may have like, 
used to be relevant, but perhaps you're no longer, um, you know, uh, requiring a particular control because your environment has changed. Um, it can really cause problems with your examination. It requires rewriting of the control. Uh, it can uh, require you to collect evidence and, and do work that you don't need to do. Um, so that's something uh, you really uh, have to pay attention to. Um, having a method for testing controls and processes uh, and requiring the documentation of those, uh, documentation of running the tests and the outcome of those tests, I think, uh, as I mentioned before, is, is a huge um, uh, time saver and really uh, reduces the burden on your organization. Um, also, um, just in general, having this testing uh, process really gives you an understanding of where your organization is for any reporting or compliance framework. Um, and again, this is something that um, uh, we are seeing is becoming more and more important, at least for NCSA, as the demand for comp research computing resources able to handle sensitive data increases. Uh, so I just wanna give a quick example uh, uh, of those first two lessons learned. Um, uh, the two example controls uh, are three example controls that I showed earlier. Two of them was the background check control and the other one was the change control uh, uh, um, uh, process. So um, in the case of the background check control, uh, this can cause delays in collecting evidence because NCSA itself does not conduct the background check, the university does. And so that's an organization that is quote unquote external to NCSA. The documentation for that exists outside of NCSA. Um, and that can be a huge bottleneck um, versus our change control process. Collecting evidence is simple. Uh, they, they're just in JIRA and a simple search pulls up all of our um, uh, uh, change control requests. And we can obviously sort that by date or go over a specific time window that's called for by the auditors. So having your processes um, sort of in some kind of system or um, some kind of issue tracker or project management or, or even, I suppose, worst case scenario, if you're you know, adding things to a Google spreadsheet as you're doing them, um, will save you a huge amount of time and headache uh, and avoid uh, exceptions in the uh, auditor's opinion on the, in the report. So, um, uh, so that's it. Um, I think I, I hope I provided a what what I think is a, a fairly broad, concise kind of overview of SOC two and how how that worked in our research computing environment. And uh, I'm happy now to answer any questions. Thanks, Alex. Um, I'm going to grab the screen. Uh, wait, actually, let me try to let me grab these uh, email addresses and try to throw them in the chat before I grab the screen. How about that? Just so that people can reach out to you if they have questions. Because um, you can't click on links in the slideshow. All right. So um, I just threw that in the chat if you want to contact Alex or Margaret. Um, we're also... <laughs> Uh, we're also going to give people time to type their questions. So while they do that, I'm going to go over some community updates. Um, first, uh, our next Trusted CI webinar is Monday, September 27th at 11 a.m. Eastern. The topic is the Q Factor Project with uh, Geronimo Bezerra. Um, also, for those of you who are interested in attending the NSA, uh, the the uh, 2021 Trusted CI NSF Cybersecurity Su Summit registration is open. So if you have seen the emails, please take advantage of registering. Um, we are holding back seats for people who are affiliated with NSF projects. So we want to get those people in the registration process. So please do not um, wait to register at the last minute. Uh, yes, the meeting is virtual, but we do uh, want to make sure that the people who deserve a seat uh, get there. So please take advantage of that. You can go to trustedci.org slash uh, 2021-cybersecurity-summit. And I can try to grab that. No, my, uh, my computer's not cooperating. So uh, I can throw that um, 
that link in the follow-up email about this presentation. And let me pull up the chat here. So we've got a few questions that came in the queue while you were presenting, Alex. Um, first of all, one person was commenting, we've got, um, we get SOC type, type two on about 10, 10 to 15% of all vendor security reviews we do. So this person is definitely immersed in the SOC two, um, um, you know, uh, compliance uh, requirements. So that, <laughs> I think they feel some of your pain. Um, we got a question here. What, which standards, guidelines, slash whatever are used for privacy? HIPAA, FERPA, GDPR, CCPA? Uh, what standards or guidelines are used for privacy? Um, for for the, the trust service criteria um, or for our, our own environment? I am, I'm not sure. <laughs> I but would just answer for your own environment. Um, well, okay. So, so our environment is EPHI, um, and it's it's uh, mainly uh, just just you know HIPAA, uh, high tech, and uh, uh, some other things the University of Illinois thinks are needed in environments that store and process EPHI. I don't know um, who um, we, where the trust service criteria for the the privacy category, uh, how those get um, uh, determined and, or, or formulated or collected. I, ho I hope that answers the question, uh, but feel free to shoot, shoot me an email uh, if, if uh, I, 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 you know, you, I can hopefully clarify if you um, want to clarify the question too. And then a follow-up to this was how can you avoid privacy? <laughs> um, so, okay. Um, through through negotiation, um, I think I saw a question uh, asking why we do SOC two type two. Um, it is required uh, by a BAA we have with one of our tenants, um, and in the negotiation, um, both both the tenant and and ourselves agreed that um, privacy was not appropriate for this environment. Um, I, I my opinion is that. You, you don't really see privacy. I, I haven't really seen it unless it's like more of a clinical setting. Um, and since this is a, a research setting and yes, it is uh, EPHI, uh, but a lot, it, and it is identifiable, but you know, a lot of work's been done to make it de-identifiable and it's not, um, you know, so there's this kind of like, you know, dances you can do and sort of, you know, make, you know, this determination, uh, we can, we can avoid privacy. Um, I, I don't really have any other, uh, you know, sort of uh, advice on, on, on how to do this other than if you can avoid it and you can get everyone to agree that it doesn't need to be done, uh, then that is the path I would take. Do you provide information on how, on implementing the testing workflow into JIRA? Yes, uh, please. Uh, I would be happy to do that. Uh, if you just shoot Margaret and myself an email, um, we can provide all the implementation details. Um, and, and we have a document on, on sort of how this is structured. And I have no problem sharing that with anybody. So we've got another question here. How did you determine the 160 controls yeah. uh, from some framework like NIST? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And that really um, sort of uh, uh, accentuates uh, you know, what, what is going on with the SOC 2 examination. The, those controls are, are controls that we collected primarily from um, three locations. Um, NCSA's own security policies for this environment. Um, the University of Illinois has what it calls a privacy and security directive, um, our HIPAA privacy and security directive. It's a collection of controls um, that it deems or, or that it dictates has to be followed in any U of I system. And NCSA is a part of the U of I uh, that stores and process EPHI. That document 
I think is derived from uh, NIST 800, and I apologize. Uh, there's a NIST 800 uh, series document that um, gives recommendations for HIPAA. Um, and th that document is primarily derived from, from that NIST document. And then the third place we get our controls from would be any BAAs or data use agreements um, from, from data or tenants in our uh, healthcare computing environment. But the bulk of controls are going to be from the U of I's um, HIPAA Security and Privacy Directive. Um, and, and again, that's, that's derived from NIST recommendations. Uh, another question here, is an audit being done remotely or in person? What kind of audit um, cannot be done remotely? Um, well, uh, we, so, so, so far, um, all of our audits, uh, well, before the pandemic, they were done in person, but um, uh, we did an entire SOC 2 type 2 examination through Zoom. Um, and it was, I mean, it was deemed acceptable that the auditors didn't have any problem with it, obviously. Um, and in many respects, it was kind of easier to do it through Zoom uh, because the auditors would ask you for permission uh, to take screenshots. And if you give them permission, they would just take screenshots of, um, you know, <laughs> sometimes it was as mundane as, can you show me an LS in this directory so I can see all of your, um, you know, a backup integrity uh, logs or something like that. And it was a step that didn't have to be done by our storage engineer. And so um, there are definitely advantages to having this done through Zoom. Um, coordinating all the meeting times and whatnot uh, was a huge, huge uh, amount of work though. So I guess there's pluses and minuses to it. I, I don't know of any requirement that an audit has to be done in, in person. Um, so I, I don't know if that answers the question or not. Well, let's um, let's do a last call for questions. I think uh, we've answered everything that's in the queue. Um, so just to give people time to type, Alex, do you have any, any final thoughts or um, any, anything you want to say before we fin wrap things up here? Uh, no, but I, I mean, I would, uh, one of the things I'd be really interested in knowing or learning is what other organizations or groups have had to go, go through SOC 2 Type 2. I've, I've informally asked in various venues, um, NSF Cybersecurity Summit, I've, you know, talked to people there and other places that I've, I've never yet encountered anyone that's actually gone through it. Um, but I, 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 have, I have heard of, uh, through secondhand, uh, anecdotally, other organizations that have, I don't have details, but I'm just curious if anyone else has had to go through this um, and what, what their experiences are. Um, yeah, I can put, a, put on a request to, to contact you. Yeah, that, that would be, that'd be excellent because um, here, uh, UF, I'm guessing University of Florida has been asked to present a SOC 2, but we negotiated that NIST 853 um, mid-rate FISMA was good enough, sounds like. Yeah, I, that is, I, and I hear that um, sometimes, that uh, uh, SOC 2 type 2 is uh, maybe, maybe being asked of an organization or being required and then the organization's able to sidestep it with uh, something that's comparable or um, some other sort of uh, way to demonstrate uh, that their organization is secure. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I just want to thank you again for agreeing to present. Um, and uh, if anyone has any questions for you or Margaret, um, they know how they know how to contact you. But I'll also put that in the in the follow up email. And um, thanks everybody for attending this presentation. Thanks again, Alex. Thank you.